we're looking at a series called Building Together. And, and if you were here last August or were joining us online at that point, uh, it's the series that, that I want to kind of return to every August as we kind of define who we are and who we want to be as a church. And so I know that there's people that are new here. And so as we kind of move, know that some of this is a refresher course for people that have been here for a while. Some of this is brand new, even to people who've been here for a while. But either way is we're going to continue to kind of uh, communicate what we want to do and what we want to be about as a church. And so today the theme is, is no God. No God, specifically through, through worship and teaching. And, and the primary place that we emphasize with this is on Sunday mornings, but we recognize that worship and teaching takes place in a bunch of other places. So we are going to have a memory verse for the next four weeks, and it's, uh, it's an important one. It's actually called the Great Commission. A lot of people call this, and, and I know you, it's hard maybe to read it up here, but you can read it on the screens here in the worship center as well. But it's Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And if you do me a favor, and we'll read this together. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of age. Matthew 29, 19 through 20. So one of the easiest ways to start letting Scripture become more a part of your story is to memorize pieces of Scripture. And the way I do that is I take that Scripture and I put it on a note card and I will just read it to myself and I place it in different places. And then inevitably I forget where that note card is and then I write it on a second note card. And then about the fifth or sixth note card that I've lost and replaced, I have got it written on my heart. And so whatever your journey is of getting these Scriptures to be a part of your spirit, your heart, is an important part as we grow forward together in relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Matthew 29, 19 through 20, you can post that on your own uh, refrigerator, whatever that is. Now, our passage for this morning is a little bit different. It comes out of uh, the book of Philippians. And God is putting Philippians at the center of my heart for some reason, and I'm not sure really what that's going to ultimately look like. But in January, we're going to spend eight weeks looking at the book of Philippians. And so stay very far away tuned, okay? Uh, But this passage for us today is from Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 7 through 11. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. And and honing in particularly here in verse 10 and 11, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection of from the dead. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. The word of God for the people of God, and the people of God said, thanks be to God. So this is the beginning point of a four-part series, and we're going to work through a little bit of what that pathway kind of looks like as part of what we're doing, but it's really ultimately to define everything that we want to be about as a church. And here's the beauty of this, is none of this is new. It's just taking what is historical in the Christian story and putting it into words and tangible way that we can make it our reality. So today, as I mentioned, is to know God through worship and teaching. So our, one of the pieces of our four-part pathway is to help you know God through teaching and worship. And so when we say, what is New Covenant doing? Well, we want to help people know God through worship and teaching. And so we're going to say that enough where it becomes our reality. I thought one of the ways that it would be important for us to get kind of a bigger concept of what that means is for me to actually spend some time telling a little bit more about my story. There are moments, uh, believe it or not, where I ask this question that a lot of people ask. Why am I doing this? Okay? Now, for some of you, you may be in this room and saying, I don't really want to think about the fact that Jay maybe questions this. Now, here's the deal. I'm not in some sort of existential crisis. I am too young for a midlife crisis. Well, maybe not. I'm 40. That's about the time, but that's not what I'm going through. Uh, But I'm asking this question because I think it's important for us when we come into contact with things that begin to fracture some of the ways that we thought the life would be or the world would be around us or some of the visions that we have for things. When those things kind of get attacked in some way, it's important for us to answer this question in our hearts. 
Let me, let me phrase that another way. And I don't always love talking about things like this, but I do think this is a reality in our world, but I know for some people it makes them uncomfortable. Here's a, here's a hard truth, is that there is an enemy, a pr- power and principality that is not from this world or of this world that wants to destroy the work of God inside of us. And for me, as a pastor and leader, I have recognized in my journey that there have been little voices of doubt and dissension that creep into my mind that are most definitely not of Jesus. But there are these moments where the devil is trying to work to thwart the work of God inside of me. And so what I've figured out is if I can define this question, the answer to this question in my heart, it gives me the tools I need to refute the lies of the devil. I'm sorry I've said the devil three times. For some of you, you're like, is that something? Yes, we believe in the devil here. Uh, We believe in him in the sense of like he has, you know, been defeated by Jesus, but he's still part of the story until the end of uh, time. Uh, well, that's, that's for another sermon series when I'm out of town. All right. The heartbeat, the heartbeat of why I'm doing this is because I am certain of the fact that God has called me to be in ministry, has called me to be in ministry, and that is what I constantly go back to, in the sense that there's a story of a guy named Jonah. Jonah got swallowed by a whale. Everybody know that story? Yes. Okay, thank you. Where are you? Yes. Thank you, Stella. So God, the reason that Jonah was swallowed by a whale is because he was avoiding his call. God says to him, hey, listen, I want you to go and preach to the Ninevites. Call them to repentance. And if they accept repentance, I will make them part of my people. And Jonah's like, they're terrible people. I'm not going to go do that. And so he jumps on a boat to try to avoid the whole thing. And then the boat gets attacked by this storm and all these things are happening. And Jonah rolls out and he goes, listen, it's my fault. Like I really made God mad because I'm ignoring the call that he put on my life. And so they toss him overboard. A fish eats him. So the moral of that story is if God has called you to something, you probably want to do that. Or you might be eaten by a whale. Okay? I'm not saying that that's a guarantee, but it is a possibility. Uh, but for me, as I've recognized in this journey of being a pastor, man, first service was giggling the whole time. Y'all are okay. Uh, they look at me like a kid, so I'm like, you know what I'm talking about? And they're like, yes, good job, grandson. Um, <laughs> so they grade on a curve, you know. Uh, but the heart, the heart of what God is, uh, oh, man. Um, but the heart of, of what drives me every day, is the fact that God has called me. And I knew this calling like pretty early on. I was in high school, started thinking I was, be, I was either going to be a teacher and a coach or uh, in ministry of some sort. And I saw some people I did life with, John Gilstrap being one of them who's on our staff. And I just said, what they're doing is awesome. And, and I think I want to do that. And here's what's happened for me, is the more that I did what God had put in my heart to do, the more that calling became more certain. And so I've stepped into this role, like I've only been the senior pastor here for 13 months, which feels like like 10 years, right? The last 13 months aged us, amen? Yeah, I see the Botox out there. Um, Just kidding. (laughs) It's in me. Um, So the reality... The reality is that I've been doing this for 13 months, and, and even in the midst of like the storms of the last year, like what I have been able to recognize is that like this is who God has called me and shaped me to be. And, and I stand on that promise a lot, like I said, because there's a lot of things that try to pull apart. So I wanted to kind of parse maybe through a little bit more about what that call looks like. The first one goes back to our passage out of Philippians chapter 3. And just to break this down in a few tangible ways that my call is shaped is that part of my calling is to know God personally and then to make God known. To know God in my own life, because here's the deal, is I can't lead anybody where I'm not going. And so at the heart of who I am as a pastor in this community is that first and foremost, I have to be pursuing God with my whole life. And honestly, it's not always that easy because life gets busy. But at the heart of my call is that I need to first and foremost know God and then as part of that to make God known. And we'll talk about this a little bit, how it shapes kind of a mission statement for us as a church. But parsing this a little bit more into Philippians chapter 3. In verse 8, that I may gain Christ, part of my call, be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Verse 10, I want to know Christ. 
Read these as your own words. That's my word about understanding the first part of my calling. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings and become like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So at the heart of what God has put in me is to know God and to make God known. The second piece of this is this fun word, zealous. Zealous. Early on in my story, as I mentioned, I thought I was going to be a teacher or a coach. I love football. I thought football was going to be my life. Football is life uh, for any of you Ted Lasso fans. But the reality of that story is the fact that that was not what God wanted for me. I could have done it. I could have been happy. Like things would have been good. But the reality is that God continued to weave my path to be where he is. And the reason is, is early on in my story, I started to realize that God was calling me to be in the church. Uh, There's a passage where Jesus clears the temple. In the Synoptic Gospels, it's later in the story in the book of John. It's early in the story. But either way, Jesus clears the temple. And he runs out the money changers. And he says, my house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. But that's not what you've made it into. And the disciples, in my mind, I have them like pictured like, like big eyed, like, uh, this is going to be problematic. Like, you don't clear the temple, especially around the time of Passover. This, they may even kill this guy for him. They did. Spoiler alert. So, at the heart of this, they refer back to Psalm 69. And they say, they remembered that the psalmist said that zeal for his house would consume him. And I'm talking like 25 years ago, I began to feel that God was putting that passage as part of my story, that he was putting in me a zeal for the church, a heart for the church. And so that's driving a lot of why God has called me to be a part of it. Trust me, there are moments where it would be easier to do this thing called leading and pastoring and being nice if we didn't have to deal with the thing called the church. But it's just the reality that God has called me into the church. Why? Why? Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 is a passage you've heard me talk about a lot, but this stands at the heart of why God has called me into the church. Matthew 10, 24 through 25 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. The author of Hebrews recognized the importance of the gathered church. And I think there's nothing that is probably more under attack in the church than the gathered church. Because it's easier every single week, every single day, to not make a priority of showing up to be with people. And here's the deal. The reminder is this. This building is not the church. The people are the church. So I'm not telling you that, hey, you need to come and gather in corporate worship. And if you're not here on Sunday mornings, that you're living outside of the call that God has in your life. I mean, maybe I am saying some of that, but the other thing is is the fact that you need to be gathered with people who are challenging you, pushing you, encouraging you, and then you're worshiping together with them. So ultimately, I don't, I shouldn't say this, ultimately care whether or not that takes place in this building. Just shoot us your number so we can count you. So Jesus is reminding us in his story that we are called to gather together, and at the heart of that is because this matters. The gathered church matters. It's still the primary conduit to which God is transforming the world. His Holy Spirit, alive and active in the church of God, changing the world around it. There were probably cleaner ways to change the world, but this is the option that Jesus gave us. And so the church matters, and I believe that in every core of my being. And so I'm called to be a pastor in the church, not to be somebody who's outside of it telling the church how it should function in a different way. And the heart of that is ultimately because God has called me in the same way that Paul called one of the churches he planted. Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own son. To shepherd, to watch over yourselves and the flock that the Holy Spirit has made me to be an overseer of. So that's the heart of it. So that's one of it. So first one, to know God, to make God known. Second one is that God has put in me a zeal for the church. And I'm telling you, I consume church stuff all of the time. I love to think about how the church can reach new people all of the time. That's what drives the energy in my heart uh, on a week-to-week basis. And the last one, and and this is not all-inclusive, but it does have uh, the three big hits of part of why God has called me to be a pastor, is this passage, which is another one of my favorite ones, out of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. Preach the word. 
Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. For a time is coming. Excuse me. I back up. Okay. Preach the word. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience and teaching. So that's one piece of it. And then there's a why that Paul even gives to Timothy. For a time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. They will turn away from listening to the truth, and they will wander away to the myths. Jesus has put in my heart, as you can probably tell, a heart to preach the gospel to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And I can't shake that. You want to talk about the thing that is the most Jonah-like in my story? I'm not the greatest shepherd. I own that. That's why we hire incredible people like Amber Hoker to be a shepherd for our flock. That's not my natural giftedness. But what God has put in me is a fire that if I shut my mouth, it will escape somewhere else. Preach the word. Proclaim the message is another translation. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. So what drives me is the absolute call that God has put on my life to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why does this matter? Because I want you to know the heart of what drives every single conversation that we have as a church. As your senior pastor, which still feels very strange, this is what I'm all about. I want to know God. I want to make God known. I want to build the church because I think the church still matters, and I want to preach the gospel. And here's the cool part about that is this isn't like, I'm not the first person to ever define those things. Like, wow, Jay, you want to make disciples? You want to preach the gospel? Like, this has been at the core of who we are supposed to be for 2,000 years. And so all I want to do is make sure that we define what we're going to be about, rooted in the biblical story of what God is calling the church to be, and then we evaluate every single thing that we do through the lens of who we're supposed to be. So every decision I make is rooted in my call. I can't detach myself from that heartbeat. Here is kind of the heart of where we're headed over the next four weeks. It's a discipleship pathway, recognizing that 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 discipleship, even though we wish it was linear, we even look at the story of Peter. Peter's story was like this. He's doing great, and he fails, and he does great, and he fails, and he does great, and he fails, all the way until he finally is martyred where he achieves perfection in Jesus. Discipleship is not a linear pathway. There are many ways that people enter into this process, but if we were going to define four heartbeats of what we want to be about as a church, rooted in the scripture, it's this, to know God through weekly worship and teaching. Next week, we're going to talk about finding community in weekly family groups, Sunday school, small groups, midweek classes. Make disciples. This is the one that's going to take some work because it's going to be a new process for us, but we're going to be making disciples and discipling relationships. And the last one on the 29th of August is change the world through missions, evangelism, and volunteering. None of this is profoundly new. None of this is even really different than the things we've tried to been, do, been doing for the last 30 years. It's not any different than any other church around the block, that they're trying to do roughly the same thing. But we are doing something as we are defining what we want to be about so that it's clear and concise and known to everybody. So when you come and you say, hey, we should do this, I come back and I say, where does it fit? right? And now you're going to be like, well, where does Pelican Bay fit? Find a community, right? Find a community, people. I'll go through that another day. So know God through worship and teaching. Um, yeah, perfect. So why does this matter? God's heart, God's heart for you and me is that we would be his reflection in the world. And how do we do that? As we gather together, we're transformed by the grace of God, and we go forward to be the love of God for the world. And that's what drives this new kind of mission statement that has bubbled its way up just in conversation that we're talking about. New covenant exists ultimately for two purposes, to experience the love of God and to help people experience the love of God so that we can become the love of God for the world. It's what the new room group, the seedbed group is defining as the two halves of the gospel. A lot of churches stop at one or the other. A lot of churches focus all of their attention on missional work, and so their whole heartbeat is to become the love of God in the world or be the love of God in the world. Some churches only focus on evangelism, and so the whole point is that you come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that there's a holistic aspect of the gospel of experiencing the love of God through evangelism, through inviting our friends to know who Jesus is through our love. 
but also the point of that is not so we just find salvation, but the point of that is that we would be transformed by Jesus and would go out to be the hands and feet of Jesus or be the tangible love of God in the world. That's the heart of what God is cultivating here in this community. Now, I love illustrations, as you all probably know. I told Nathan, I said, it feels weird for you not being up here with a puppet, uh, and so I'm not going to do that again. But what I am going to do is just recognize that earlier this week, you may didn't know this, but it was National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day. Did y'all know that? Are y'all there? Did y'all know that it was National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day? Yeah, well, you missed out. <laughs> Luckily, I've got cookies for everybody. Um, I don't. I have cookies for everybody. So I was listening to a podcast this week, a guy named Henry Cloud, who wrote a book called uh, Boundaries. He, boundaries for leaders, boundaries for all sorts of things, relationships. He's a psychiatrist, but he's also a theologian, and so he kind of balances both of those conversations. And, and I was listening to this podcast this week, and he came up with some imagery that I thought was really important for us. Okay, so think of it this way. Obviously, this is crude in the sense that chocolate chip cookies are not, uh, are not the same as helping people experience the love of God and becoming the love of God of the world, right? But, I mean, kind of, maybe, you can both experience the love of God through an encounter with chocolate chip cookies and giving them to other people, say your pastor, is a way to show the love of God in the world, okay? But here's what I want you to know, is if we saw this as the ultimate goal of our ministry time church is to make chocolate chip cookies, how many of you in this room have a recipe that you would share to make chocolate chip cookies? Almost everybody, right? Everybody became a baker in the last year. It's cool. Good job. Here's the thing. Not every other recipe is going to be the same, right? Chocolate chip cookies is the ultimate game. For some of you, you do. You use vanilla extract and baking soda. You use, oh, no, that's the way I make them, the pre-made packages. Uh, flour, sugar. Some of you use butter, brown sugar. Some of you use regular chocolate, semi-sweet. Some of you use dark chocolate. Whatever it is is part of the story. Some eggs in there. Whatever it is that helps you to make chocolate chip cookies, it doesn't matter. The point is what? To make chocolate chip cookies, but what happens in our journey as part of the church is we make the ingredients or the strategy the heartbeat of the whole church. I don't give a rip about the strategy that we use to reach new people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when we have conversations, I say to our staff, we will throw everything at the wall to see what sticks. And if it doesn't stick, we evolve and change and we learn and we move forward. Because the strategy of making chocolate chip cookies is not the point. The point is, are we reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we trying new methods and methodologies and strategies to reach new people? And I've said this before, and I stole it from Craig Rochelle, and look what they're doing. I understand that we don't want to be Life Church. They are who they are. We are who we are. But he says to reach people who no one else is reaching, you've got to do things that nobody else is doing. So that's going to drive so much of what we do. Everything we do is evaluated through the lens of whether or not it helps people experience the love of God and become the love of God in the world. And so I'm telling you, we are a permission-giving mood. If you come to me right now and you say, hey, I think the way we're going to do it is this ministry. And if this ministry is going to reach these people in this place, I'm going to say, awesome, go give it a shot. Gather some people, go do it. We're going to say yes a lot we're going to say yes a lot because we believe that the gospel is still relevant in the lives and hearts of people. I think the gospel is as needed now as it has been in any time ever. People are searching and seeking out wholeness and all sorts of other things. But what we believe is the story that Nathaniel shared is that wholeness is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we bring to the world. We bring the wholeness of Jesus Christ to the world. The ingredients have to change with the times. Now, that doesn't mean you water down stuff. I think there are things like you can't make chocolate chip cookies without one of these ingredients. Eggs, maybe. I don't know. I'm not a baker. So there are things that have been defined for us by the history of the church that we don't waver from, but there's a lot of ability for strategy to be flexible as we evolve as a church, as long as the heart of the ultimate goal to help people experience the love of God and become the love of God drives everything. And here's the hard part, is denominations have been born and church splits have arisen 
because somebody disagreed on the way we make chocolate chip cookies. And there's just a reality that, and I literally didn't write any of this, but if you're new here and you're not a Methodist and you don't even know what a Methodist is, then you can just ignore this, but I'm letting you know that on the horizon is that. There's a split that's coming because some people want to do things differently. And it really creates a ton of just ache in me, heartbreak in me, Um, but it feels as inevitable as anything that I've ever been around in the church. And so what can we do in the midst of that? This is really for free. I wouldn't even plan on doing this. So what can we do in the midst of this? Is we can stay centered on the things that matter. Because we can't control what's happening in Minnesota in 2022. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? Don't worry about it. (laughs) Uh, We can't control what's going to happen when General Conference gathers and they have these conversations thousand miles away. Um, But what we can do is make sure that New Covenant is all in on helping people know the love of God and becoming the love of God in the world. And so until until that decision comes to our plate, our table, we have to have some hard conversations at the church. What we're going to do is we're going to be all in on reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel changes lives. And I believe that with every fiber of my being. That's why I hitched my wagon to the church. I was ordained last November, and in a year and a half after that, we're going to be having denominational conferences that split me at the core. Well, why? Because I believe that Jesus still wants to use the church to change the world. That's it. So here's the deal. We're going to make cookies. We're going to help people experience the love of God to become the love of God in the world. So how do we do that? We do that through our pathway. Um, to help people know God through worship and teaching, to find community through family groups, small groups, midweek classes, to make disciples through discipling relationships, to change the world through evangelism, missions, and service, or volunteering here in the local church. And so here's the deal. Here is the easiest way for you to respond today. Show up, jump in, and bring a friend. Show up. Uh, And I know this is hard, man. We live in like a transient kind of world like we're just busy and we have stuff every weekend I get all of that um but there's a way for you to make sure that you prioritize gathering with Christ community right and so what I would ask you to do is just make a priority this now school starts on Thursday life is kind of normalizing the lakes I think all the lakes close tomorrow and so um (laughs) thanks uh so show up you can join us online. Like it's one of the beauties of, of one of the, the beauties of the last year of chaos and crazy and, and awfulness is the fact that we've increased our online experience in a way that, that we're really proud of and grateful for and able to share with the world around us. And so if, even if you're not here, you can still show up. Uh, jump in, and I'll get back to that one in a minute. And the last one is this is like one of the easiest things you can do is if you feel like God is doing something pretty crazy here that is good and you're excited about it, um, it should be pretty easy for you to invite somebody to be a part of it. Um, I don't share, like if I go and eat, I've shared this imagery before, but if I go and eat a great meal, I'm going to tell somebody about what that meal was about with like a lot of gusto, partly because I have a problem with food, but more so in the sense of just like, because you want to share the experiences that change your experience. So invite somebody to be a part of that. Um, and that's all it takes. Like, Hey, come to church with me. See what God is doing at New Covenant. We love what's going on. We're excited about this. Uh, Pelican Bay is cool. Whatever it is, is bring a friend to be a part of that. And the last one, or the second one on this, but the last one I want to make sure we emphasize is jump in. Jump in. What does that look like? Um, I think it starts with the question is, what do you expect when you show up here on Sunday mornings? What do you expect when you show up on Sunday mornings? Um, And I think there's multiple ways to kind of process that, but I think part of it is we do expect to come and experience community, which is awesome. Y'all are fantastic. Y'all are a lot of fun, and I like hanging out with you a lot. But what if when you showed up in this room, you came with an expectation to go all in uh, in worship and praise of God the creator? What if your expectation shifted a little bit? When we believe that, that part of who we are is to know God through worship and teaching, what if you came with a heart of anticipation, ready for what's ahead? And I had some imagery that came to mind as I was, I was really putting this to paper this morning. And uh, it's this imagery. How many of you love roller coasters? Yeah, I'm a roller coaster guy. I love them. As I've aged, they've become less uh, nice to me, but I do still enjoy them. What if your experience on Sunday morning, when you were getting out of the car and you were making your way through and you opened the door, felt like this right here, where you're starting to climb up the ascent of the first hill? Where in your heart, you just started to feel the spirit start to work something. You're like, hey, maybe today 
maybe today, as I jump in, God's going to show up in a mighty way. What if this was our heart of anticipation as we showed up on Sunday morning, thinking that just on the other side of this moment where I walk through these doors, that I'm going to encounter the risen Lord today? Now, trust me, I stopped it, but look at that. The sheer terror, the anxiety, the excitement, and all those things. And I'm just kidding, I stopped it. But what if that was the posture that we showed up with? Because I, I'm telling you this, the, <laughs> the beauty is, is that God is with us. John Wesley, on his deathbed, that's what he said. He says, thank the Lord that God is with us. And so when we show up on Sunday mornings, like we're not fabricating something from nothing. We're walking to a space where the Holy Spirit has already prepared it for us. And God is saying, come into my presence and experience the power of Jesus this morning. But I don't think we show up like that. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you showed up. Like it really feels like I'm actually preaching to the choir because I'm like, you all show up and you're like, we did. But, but I want to help move us as a people from showing up to jumping in. And I just encourage you, if you're in this place and you're like, I don't know about that, it's just weird, I just showed up because I'm just checking it off my box, I'm so thankful that you're here. But I just want to encourage you, maybe the next four weeks as you just show up and you say, hey, I'm going to jump in with anticipation that I'm going to experience Jesus in a new way as part of my Sunday morning experience. I'm going to show up, I'm going to jump in. And just watch what God does in and through you. It's not, it's, it's not a, you know, I mean, I will say, like, I think that if you jump in, God's going to respond. Like, I'm not going to back away from that thought. Show up, jump in, invite somebody to be a part of it with you.